and welcome to Sports Tonight Live. And this is our show, the World of Football Show. I'm your host, Mina Rizuki, and today we don't have Filippo Claire, so that's a bit sad. But we have a replacement, and his name is Owen White, and he's from Reuters. I'm also here with Raf Honigstein because he really likes to be here. Um, <laughs> today we're going to be talking about the Euro 2012. Um, well, all of the draw, really. What everyone thinks, opinions. We're going to talk about Classico. We're going to talk Osvaldo. We're going to talk Ajax and much, much more. So let's start off with the Euro 2012. What did you think of the draw? Is Group A the easiest thing in the planet or what? Uh, yes, it is. And it's, it's sad because the draw is slightly lopsided. You've got all these great teams and... Group B, yeah. uh, you'd expect me to say that, of course, uh, Germany, Holland, no, Portugal, but there really Denmark. Is, I just remember the draw and I'm thinking, if Italy gets drawn into the steam, I will actually cry. Yeah. I will cry. Well, you might cry either way. I mean, Italy are, uh, you know, capable of getting, getting knocked out. Well, with the team that they way. have. No, Absolutely they shouldn't. Not. No, no, I'm joking. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit sad because you would, in an ideal world, you'd like to see Germany, Holland and Portugal in the quarterfinals, but one of them or perhaps two of them, if Denmark surprises us, will be out, which is a bit of a shame. I reckon Denmark could be a surprise. What did you think of the draw? Um, well, I enjoyed the collective sort of drawing of breath when uh, Germany and Holland were drawn in the same group. And let's face <laughs> it, it's thrown up some interesting fixtures. You know, I I'm looking forward to watching uh, Spain and Italy battle it out. Um, I always enjoy a Holland Germany, who doesn't? Um, so yes, I agree with, with Raf. The draw is lopsided. Group A looks, frankly, boring. Um, if you're the host Poland, you're going to want to go through that, aren't you? Yeah. I fancy them to progress with home support. Um, the Czechs were lucky to get through at all, frankly. Uh, and then looking at England's group, I think England can be very, very happy with their draw. I shouldn't think they'll have too much, too much trouble getting through. But like I say, fixtures of the first round would be Spain, Italy, Holland, Germany. I I'm not sure, Raf, how dangerous, if you take Ronaldo out of the equation, out of the equation how dangerous are Portugal? I think they're very difficult to beat. Um, they don't seem to score a lot of goals. That's been a problem for they how many decades? They have, what, Postiga? They have yeah. absolutely, like, Nuno Gomez is in there, and he was, what, 35 years old? They have yeah, absolutely they have no this, strikers. I read this ridiculous article the other day that said about something about the fact that Ronaldo had to step up and, and play for his country, and I just thought, oh, and, and the fact that everyone talks about Messi in Argentina, but really the, the person that disappoints on, the, on that stage would be Ronaldo in Portugal. But Messi is surrounded by the most talented Argentine squad. And then Ronaldo is what with Nani and Bruno Alves and Pepe, that's it's about it. It's a half-decent squad. I mean, you put Coentrao in and a few other guys. You know, on paper, they should be OK. The problem is that they never seem to really gel as a team. And they haven't for I don't know how many years. I mean, in the Euro 2008, they were actually favourites um, in that quarterfinal against Germany and were played off the park, albeit on the counter-attacking star from Germany but since then you see the two teams in Germany are up there and Portugal at best have stagnated and um, a lot of it is is down to Ronaldo and, and that's not really a viable system in international football anymore maybe in the days of Socrates Maradona you'd had these one guys who could carry a whole team I don't think it's possible anymore no I don't think so um, so Spain and Italy clash of ideologies now I know that uh, for some reason, Spain really looks down on Italian football because what well, they're meant to be defensive, yet, you know, Spain are notoriously the choke masters, always choking on the big stage, whereas Italy has won four World Cups. What do you think about that? I, I, yeah, I was looking at this before we came in. This, this idea of Spain being choke masters, I think the okay, last Okay, well, two, not anymore, obviously. Yeah, let, let's just forget that, I think. Uh, they, they are no longer choke masters. I yeah, but they were still the World Cup team that won with the fewest goals scored. Okay, now, for a team that has, what, the... I'm not going to comment about listen. them because they are by far the best team at the world at the moment. Yeah, but and, 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 and let, let's face it, you know, pe people said Fernando, Fernando Torres is a ch was a choker on the big stage. And that was another thing they were banding around before the Euros that they won. And he scored, as I remember, a fantastic goal in the final. You know, he mm. can raise it too. I honestly don't see any of those teams in the group or the competition posing them any trouble at all. I think really, they're going to walk through England the group and Italy the final, defeated them in the friendlies. What do you think about that? You can't read too much into these friendlies. No. Since they won the World Cup, they've been to and fro all over the world on yeah. their money-spinning mission um, for, for the Spanish League. We're not talking about League. South America and Costa Rica. But th these friendlies I read nothing into. No, they will be fine. And, and as I a think it's almost a way of silent protest they've been losing all these uh, friendlies because they don't want to be there. Yes, OK, it's one thing to play at Wembley and they were kind of half up for it, but you could see that their heart wasn't really into it. But then the next, very next day, as Owen said, they were off to Costa Rica. I mean, how do you raise your game for that? Yeah, OK, so they've been messed around a little bit. What about France? Now they look like they could be... 
Like for France, read Portugal. I mean, France have um, no, have no, no. better players, better but players. as a team, they're probably worse. And I mean, a better coach. The, well, I think the jury is still out. Uh, Laurent Blanc came in with all these big ideas, the revolution, etc. Have they really convinced? Look at their qualifying. I mean, they really had a hard time. They, they hardly played any decent football. The best game probably they played in recent years was the one against England in the friendly, where they were up for it and they had played England at Wembley. But anything else? I don't know. Maybe I think this, this France Blanc. side is still flattering to deceive, and I still think that Blanc doesn't know himself what kind of team he wants, what kind of tactics he wants, uh, what kind of formation he wants. It's all still an experiment. Two years down the line, that's not good. And there's a player coming on the map in France. If you look at the French league now, no one at the beginning of this season thought that Montpellier would be atop the league. There's a player in France who could come into the mix for their team, this guy Giraud, who plays up front uh, for Montpellier. Oh yeah, the one who scored a hat-trick last week. I'll tell you something, he's got, a, he's got a goal scoring record. He scored a goal every other game his entire career, and he's an absolutely fantastic finisher. If he can continue the form he's on this year, I don't see why he can't start for them. But I'd agree with Raf. I don't see them getting to the semi-finals either. You know, Do this... you see England reaching the semi-finals? Yes. I'm not Do sure. Do you actually um, see them reaching the semi-finals? Yes. With or without Rooney. Would you but take Rooney? Then, then they'll have to be either Spain or Italy in the quarters. I don't see that happening. I can see it happening. Really? Yeah. And, and do you think they should take Rooney with them? I think if Rooney doesn't win his appeal, no, they shouldn't. Why, why can you see England doing so well against these teams? I mean, you're talking about Germany, which is probably the best team I've watched. In my opinion, they're even better than Spain. You've got the Netherlands, you've got Italy, you've got Spain. What, what makes you think that England can get to the semi-final? Capello came under a lot of flack at the World Cup, and rightly so. But I still believe there's something in that guy. There's a winner in there somewhere. And I think <laughs> that, that he'll prove... Of course he's a winner. He's a winner, but England, the squad winners. I think that he can. I think he can get it done. I honestly see them doing them surprising a lot of people at this tournament. I think England can can really pull something off. Beating Spain, okay, that's another matter. But on their day, you know, I, 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 I kind of agree with you. But I mean, I also felt that um, at the World Cup, for all their um, well, horrible uh, lack of of quality, they were only one goal away from getting into the position that Uruguay were in, and probably would have made it also to the semi final. So the the, the margins for error are very, very small, and just a slightly better performance could have had a big impact. So I agree with you. I think England have a chance. For me, they're also the dark horses. The problem is, I think Capello, for all his experience, for all his mentality, himself still doesn't quite understand this team, doesn't quite understand what's yeah. wrong with them. Mm. Uh, he puts forward always... all sorts of different excuses, uh, sometimes the same, sometimes yeah. different ones. And I honestly feel that he doesn't know what to do with these guys? This is a man who's won with Real Madrid. This is a man who won with Juventus and Roma. This guy knows. It, you know, I mean, I think there has to be a stage where you recognise that England is just not the squad that everyone thinks they are. That they're just not capable of winning. And it may be something to do psychologically because of their past. It could be because the squad is just literally not strong mm. enough. I, I think Vias Boas and Capello have got the same problem. They've both got to drop Don John Terry, but neither of them really wants they've to do it. They've just got to drop a lot of them. Ooh. One word. Who do you guys reckon is going to win it? Germany. Spain. Italy. Spain get knocked out by England. England and Spain, that's the, that's the match for me. I, I'm, I'm yet, to, yet to draw my 100% conclusion. It'll hang on that match. OK, well, that's all we have time for um, on, on this topic. We're going to come back and talk about uh, Socrates and his passing away and, of course, Corinthians winning. See you after the... Hello and welcome back to the World Football Show here on Sports Tonight Live. I'm Mina Rizuki and now we're going to be talking, uh, it's actually a sad note, we're talking about Socrates passed away and it's, it's his funeral today and of course I remember him mainly as his time during Fiorentina and they actually really lovely yesterday, they wore black armbands to commemorate his death. Obviously a great player, what are your memories of him? Well, I was nine years old when the 1982 World I Cup... I would have thought you would be a lot older than that, Ralph. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> kicked off, and of course it made a huge impression on me. Um, any half-decent team made a big impression on me at that age, but of course Brazil were just a wonderful, wonderful team, probably the best team uh, in that competition. Of course, Italy knocked them out, we all know that, but yeah. Brazil was something else. Best. And of course this guy, the way he looked, the way he played, it was just different. He seemed to have his own rhythm. Um, I remember Maradona being hyped up before that uh, tournament. He didn't quite deliver, um, and uh, I think he lost his head a little bit, uh, got sent off. But Socrates had this kind of 
effortless, elegant charm and played a different game to any, anyone else. So it, it was, was really amazing. unusual considering he's six foot four, but he had the grace and elegance of someone so much shorter than him. And, and he was just like, he skipped around the field. That's whenever I saw him, I thought, this, you know, this man is just not a, a lanky footballer like someone you can imagine. With his kind of stature, you'd imagine him playing in, an entirely different game. Would you have you have some weird facts about him? Um, well, not many footballers these days are qualified doctors or heavy smokers, and he was both. And one, a heavy drinker. <laughs> I think one of the things that you know I'll remember of him is, and it's a, it's a trait I admire in all the best footballers that I've followed in my career, is an ability never to look rushed and to create space out of nothing. You know, just an effortless, like you say, Raf, just this seamless ability to just flow wonderful flowing player and I, I, th I think you know that team in in, in uh, 1982 just lacking a quality striker if they'd had someone who could put the ball in the back of the net maybe we're talking about him as a world cup winning captain but um, but yeah it's a, it's a sad loss for football mm, we have actually we have some of his best goals at the moment that we can have a look at in a second um but he was probably would you say that was the best team 1982 to have never won the world cup yeah and when you look at these pictures here one of his idols was che guevara he doesn't look that dissimilar to him does actually he, he was very much of um he was very much of a politician and really yeah he, che guevara was actually his uh look at that goal i don't oh know sorry Raph, i jumped in there do you think that was one of the best the best team not to win well it? i was going to say the 86 team was also quite special I and mean, you could have easily mentioned them as some of the best one of the best what, the Brazilian team? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think the midfield was quite old by then. They weren't really ticking the way that they were ticking in 1982. I don't know. You're obviously older than me. You remember it better. <laughs> but uh, The Botox uh, must be really working. <laughs> 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 yeah, I have to say, I wasn't born in 1982, but YouTube is a wonderful thing. So uh, I, had a, I refreshed my memories before I came on. But I think like we were saying before, you know, fantastic midfield. There just wasn't much spread to that team, right? They didn't have the defence or, or strikers to, to back up the creativity they had had in midfield. And then, of course, they came up against Italy's defence. Mm -hmm. But we've got John Cottrell here from Brazil, and he can give us... Hi, John, how are you? Hello, I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Tell us a bit more, because I understand today was the funeral. Well, it was, yeah. He died here in Sao Paulo, one of the local hospitals at around 4.30 local time on Sunday morning. Uh, and his death really coincided with the, the final day of the Brasilia Rao, where one of his team's Corinthians, in fact, won the Campeonato Brasileiro. So it's a very, very emotional day here in Brazil, especially in Sao Paulo, especially with Corinthians. Uh, Socrates is a very, very popular figure, both on and off the pitch. So how has it been covered by the media over there? What, what have they been saying about it? Well, it's, a, it's not just a football. It's a, it was a huge figure, a huge personality. I heard your speakers talking about his, uh, the fact that he's a doctor, the fact that he's a very intelligent player. He formed a movement called the uh, Corinthians Democracy Movement as well. So he was involved in politics in the 80s, but a huge figure, very popular. Before the kickoffs of all the games, which were at 5 p.m. local time, on Sunday, there was a minute of silence, a minute of silence, Brazilian style is not exactly that quiet, but it was respected not just by Corinthians, but by all the teams, all 20 teams in the Brazilian realm on Sunday. So a very popular figure and somebody who will be missed. So the Corinthian players did a salute, is that right, yeah? The idea is they, they raised their right arm which is what uh, Socrates was famous for when he celebrated a goal. So the Corinthians players and the uh, players who they faced yesterday also did the exact same thing, the Palmeiras players, who are Corinthians' big arch enemies. They did the same thing. Everyone stood around the center circle. Just the, Pal just the Corinthians players raised that right arm as an homage to Socrates. And, they, and many fans wanted the team to dedicate this fifth Brazilian title to the player. Yes, of course. What are your memories of him, John, as a player and as a man? <laughs> You know, I was a bit, quite a bit younger when uh, he was playing, of course, but I do remember that style. Some of you speakers were talking about this distinctive style he had. He was a tall player. He had that kind of flair about him, that elegance about him as a, as a player. And, of course, that bullet shot as well, as well as a deft touch. So, he had, you know, he had everything as a player. Uh, he never won a World Cup. In fact, it's funny, I just looked at his record now, that the only things he actually did win as a player were local state championships, which is a bit of a surprise somebody of his ability. John, now, 
you, t you said that Corinthians wanted to win this for him. Um, you know, they did actually end up winning it. Now, I recall last week you told us that you thought Vasco would win it. No? <laughs> <laughs> I did try to explain. It took me about five minutes to explain that uh, the Brazilian football is extremely unpredictable and that I would never, ever put any money on uh, who was going to win. You know, I've been commentating on Brazilian football for 10 years now. And the only predictable thing about Brazilian football is its unpredictability. So tell us about that game. Four red cards? Four red cards. There should have been another one as well. The referee, Wilson Luis Sinemi, he really just lost control. The referees here in Brazil, the standard is slowly improving, but usually it's, it's atrocious. The, the referees do not talk to the players. You see it in the Premier League. I know people complain about the referees in the Premier League, but believe me, they are much, Miles. much better than most referees here in Brazil. Referees here don't talk to the players. They never warn them verbally. They never have a chat. They kind of straight up the cards, which is what Luis, Wilson Luis said to me, did. Straight red cards for the first two players. And then towards the end of the game, Georgie and Hiki provoked uh, Juan Victor, a Palmeiras player. There was a big melee, a big fight. And two more reds were flashed at the end. But Juan, a uh, Palmeiras man who booted, who actually kicked Georgie and Hiki right in front of one of the assistant referees, somehow he stayed on. I mean, the, the match was awful. The match was a pretty um, nil-nil, which just about says it all. Very, very few chances. Corinthians, they have a nickname which is called the Chimão, which translates as a big team, but they played, with a, they played with a very small team mentality. But they won the title. So, you know, as we say here and as we say in England, of course, the league never lies. So Corinthians deserved it, but it wasn't a great match. Thank you so much, John, and thank you for being with us for this season. It's all over for Brazil. Okay. Pleasure. Talking of red cards, uh, there was a, a really exciting match in Italy. Fiorentina beat Roma 3-0 and there were three red cards. This is the first time the fans actually called for the sacking of Luis Enrique. And you know Luis Enrique obviously because he was with Barcelona B. Um, now there's talk about this, this great philosophy that he's trying to implement. But, you know, let's be honest, what happened between Osvaldo and Lamela has received sort of bad criticism from the press because it looks like it's just a bit petty. You know, Antonio Conte from Juventus at the time said, OK, he slapped, he slapped Lamela, basically. But that's not something that you should really t take out of the dressing room. What do you think about that? I think over the summer there was a couple of managers who bit off more than they could chew. I mean, Viaz Boas is getting his teeth stuck into Chelsea. I think he's finding it a little bit difficult to swallow at the moment. And I think Luis Enrique took on a job he should have probably waited at least another kind of mid-level job in Spain before taking. Um, he wins the most haggard looking manager of the week award in his post-match news conference. He looked dreadful, like he hadn't <laughs> slept for a week. I think it's just dawning on him exactly what is it. The, the interesting thing I find about this for me is the fans think Osvaldo's untouchable. Well, you know, he is untouchable. Him. Why? This is the point though, in Italy at the moment what you've got with Roma is that you don't actually have a physical presence in attack. He is the only person that can provide that, he's the only person that can be aggressive. You need that in an Italian team when everyone is very small and able to run in between the lines. When you have a player like Osvaldo, he can offer you something different. At the moment, and you could see yesterday against Fiorentina, they just had no person in there who's able to convert. They already have a problem converting. So do you think Enrique was wrong to drop it? Yes, I think, I think it was ridiculous what he did, firstly because what he's trying to do, and I, and I was saying this before, was that Ibra was talking about how Guardiola implements this whole like obedience thing and everyone has to listen to what he says in Barcelona. And Enrique seems to be taking that across to Italy, but that doesn't work. In Italy, everyone questions everything and you have to open dialogue. And that's what Mourinho said was the reason why they won over Sporting Quijon over the, um, this weekend as well. And it just seems to be that he's just trying to adopt this, I'm the man, you listen to me and you don't have a right to talk about anything. They were all pleading Osvaldo's case. Firstly, it should never have been put into the papers. You don't need to do that. I mean, Ibra was playing with a broken rib, or with a cracked rib last season because he got into a fight with Onyeyu. But that wasn't, that wasn't leaked. And the videos were all there, but they were never shown. There's no need to do that. Do you agree? Well, I think it's just symptomatic of what's going wrong there. Um, you know, if the results were going OK, if and Luis Enrique was in a position to impose his his ideas on the squad, these things wouldn't have come out. They come out because there's obviously a tremendous uh, unrest. Uh, people are unhappy with his philosophy. He's unhappy with the players. Um, as Owen said, I mean, similar things happened at Chelsea with Vyash Boas, where all of a sudden people were briefing, you know, we heard from Vyash Boas sort of behind the scenes. He had players don't really understand what I'm doing. The players were saying, we don't really understand what he's doing. So people sort of blaming each other. And the Osvaldo thing is very much part of that because 
you know, I think Luis Enrique maybe initially thought he might be able to deflect a bit of the atten attention that's on him and on the bad results if he's, you know, being put out there as someone who, you know, is, is causing problems in the dressing room, but that backfired spectacularly. Well, maybe he should do what Mourinho does and take the attention onto himself rather than deflect it onto his players. If I were him, I'd have stuck around at Barcelona for a couple more years. He would have gone that job. No, but waited for a job in Spain to become available, like a Getafe or a Mallorca that was even available this year. Take one of those jobs, prove yourself there before jumping at something like Roma. It's, it's, yeah, for me, if body language is anything to go by, he's given up the goat already. Mm. I think that I think that what he was told a lot was that if he got the tactical knowledge that you could really only get in Italy, then he'd be an even better coach than what Guardiola is, which obviously is not right. Hello, Tancredi, how are you? Buonasera from Milano, everything is fine here. Yeah. Okay, so tell us about what's going on. Tancredi is a writer for Gazette dello Sport. Tell us what the papers are saying about this whole Osvaldo and Roma. Now, I know for, he said that he won't leave until he feels the players are no longer responding to him in the dressing room. Now, what do you think? What are the papers telling us about this whole situation? Well, all the situation is uh, really hot, I would say, in the Roma's changing room. Uh, in some way, almost, the Osvaldo story it seems already a bit dated after what happened yesterday. I will recap just a bit what, what brought Osvaldo to punch uh, Lamela. It was because uh, Lamela told him when he was keeping on complaining because he didn't pass him a ball, uh, several times actually. <laughs> and Lamela answered the reply to Osvaldo, something like, well, do you think you are Maradona? And said to some Argentinian or half Argentinian, Osvaldo is, that probably was a kind of click in his mind. But in some way, that situation was, uh, it's the alarm of the fact that uh, things that are uh, warming up very easily in Roma, but it's not something like the only alarm that stayed after yesterday. I just want to remind that Roma lost 3-0 against Fiorentina, had three red cards, and when the team went, came back uh, to Rome at the train station, because they came by train from Florence, there was kind of uh, 50 fans from Roma that were all asking uh, and not in a polite way of so, course Luis Enrique to quit and, and they were just singing for Totti they stayed on the bench. What about now I know also that Lecce ended up uh, sacking their coach uh, Eusebio Di Francesco who actually plays really nice football. Now I, I was on the BBC yesterday and, and they were talking about the fact that Italy sacks coaches every sort of every week by the sounds of it, and there's already been eight. W what is your view on that? Don't you think this is the reason why they produce amazing coaches? Or do you think this is just abysmal because we'll never have a Bielsa and an Atletico Bilbao story? Well, I would say uh, there was not always this kind of uh, miseducation in Italy uh, to second the coach too early. Uh, this year is just getting crazy. Um, probably because there is a kind of a break in a generation of great coaches, of great managers. Uh, the great ones just left Italy. Uh, in the middle, there is not the kind of generation, that you, the kind of uh, area of uh, 15 years ago that was uh, approaching slowly to the big teams. So it's happened that later in the last five years, teams like Palermo, uh, like Udinese, a uh, great season, they went very close to Champions League, or like Udinese, they went in Champions League. So all other small clubs fought that uh, it could really be possible to achieve something bigger than the real possibilities. And when this is not happening, because of course can't happen, it's just there are six seats and there are the big teams that are all, there will always be big teams. And you, all in all, you need money. Yes. To make a, to make I've a just big got, team. got to say at this point, I've lost a bet with Tan Curdy there because I bet him that he couldn't listen to Dire Straits' greatest hits whilst talking about. Italian football, and he's managed to pull it off brilliantly. Those <laughs> headphones are deceptive. They are not quiet. That is Dire Straits' greatest hits right there, and he's managed to give us that insight whilst listening to it. So £10 is on its way to you, my friend. <laughs> Tomorrow. Raf, you look so... Um, what do you look so confused uh, Dire Straits is perhaps a good, um, a good link to my question. Inter. I mean, is it yeah. any cons consolation to Roma fans that Inter even in more trouble with a, with a manager that's not going to go because they've already f sacked the manager <laughs> before. What's happening there? Yeah. Well, uh, in some way, you are right, Rafa, because uh, uh, otherwise everyone would be talking about the Roma failure. Instead, today, the big news is about Inter. Uh, situation, by the way, is very different 
Rome just changed all the philosophy that is backing uh, the club. Uh, in Inter, uh, the thing is that ID, the, problem, the main problem is the ID, the team is very aged. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, uh, Ranieri is a fixer, but he's a fixer of some fixable situation. He's not God. He can be a good worker. So when the things are going bad, maybe Ranieri can uh, help the situation for a couple of weeks, for a couple of months, if you are lucky enough. But then, if, if that is the nature of the team, you just can't make up. Uh, That's true. To build a new winner team. He's, he's far from God, I'll tell you that much. And uh, I remember that when he was at Juventus, they were very glad to see the back of him. Thank you, Tancredi. Speaking of Juventus, um, I actually think that my producer is a secret Juve fan because we've got their goals again, um, which was uh, an amazing... <laughs> Raph is looking disapproving because, because I think... It's Juventus here. Oh, it's like the Juventus show. It is the Juventus show, isn't it? This is, look at this goal. Yeah. Wow, that wasn't actually... Lucky. That was one. But if you look at this, I mean, I think Chisena was actually playing with... Look, if you notice, there's six in the box and three or two that were constantly hassling. And it was just the first half, Juventus were quite abysmal, to be honest, because they couldn't break through. Lots of changes were made in the second half. Yeah, well, they also had a tough game in midweek, we should perhaps mention, eh? So yeah, they did have a tough, uh, tough game. <laughs> Del Piero came Look on for the, a yeah, cameo got, role before getting... Oh, there he is. There it is. Nine minutes he was on the, the pitch head. before he got hit on the head accidentally, apparently, by Marco Rossi. Um, and then he has been taken off. He's OK, though, so that's not a problem. But look at that for a goal. Mm. goal the keeper. great Claudio Marchisio. Italian goalkeepers used to be quite good. Um, who? Cesena's goalkeeper? Yeah. Oh, well, I think that's actually really mean to say that was a, one of the most beautiful goals. Uh, and then, again. of course, now this wasn't actually a penalty, nor was it a red card. Um, so you have to feel sorry for them. They'd already made all their substitutions. So they had to put a central defender as their goalkeeper. Um, and then Vidal scored. Uh, Vidal scored the second goal, but I mean it was it was done and dusted really after the first. So, uh, looks like uh, do you reckon Juventus will win it now? Well, I tipped them before, of course, and uh, before I met you, and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> now stick. I'm even more sure of it. <laughs> I'll, I'll stick with them. Um, I, I just think they have they have what it takes. They seem to have just enough depth. I wouldn't say they have a lot of depth, but because they're not in Europe, I think they just have enough players and enough quality, especially in the midfield, to just keep going. Their style is very high energy, so it does take a lot uh, out of the players. And I think you could see that, that after the, the game no, before the 3-3, three, yeah. three, that they needed, um, you know, they needed a bit of a change. But but they still got the result. Well, Antonio Conte is certainly um, proving that the squad have the maturity. But that's all we have time for on Italy. After the break, we'll be talking about Ajax and the build-up to El Clasico. So see you in a few minutes. Hello and welcome back to the World Football Show. Now we're going to be talking about Ajax and Cruyff and the entire situation that's happening over there. Now, Cruyff is a great football player, but I'm not sure if he's a really nice man, or do you think that he's hard done by on this occasion? Well, Louis van Gaal, the man who's uh, supposed to take over, is, is a great football man, but perhaps also not a nice man, so I'm not sure we should <laughs> judge them on their character. But <laughs> what's happened here is, is obviously a coup. Um, you know, yes. Four out of the five uh, guys on the board got together while Cruyff wasn't there and said we were installing um, Van Gaal as the new overlord uh, in Amsterdam and of course Cruyff wasn't very happy. I understand he's taken him to court now and uh, this is probably going to run for a little bit longer. Well we've got Jan here. Hello Jan, how are you? Hello, very well, thank you very much. Um, tell us about the situation. So did you think that the other four just had enough with Cruyff and decided to sort of say, do as Raf just said and sort of coup, do a coup and uh, just go ahead with it without his well, consent? Absolutely, they had enough of him. I'm not sure if you can call it a coup. Of course, they have formed the five of them, including Cruyff, the board of directors of Ajax. And the, 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 the real managing director of Ajax, Rick van der Boog, resigned in the beginning of August. So since then, Ajax has not had a managing director. It is a little bit like a ship without a captain. And they try to find a new managing director for a long time. And... Uh, very early in the uh, process, Cruyff 
uh, added the name of Chola Ling, that's a former player of Ajax and Ado Den Haag and a former national player, uh, as his ideal candidate. And the board looked to it and all the other four said, well, he's not qualified for uh, lots and lots of reasons. And since then, and that is where the, where the problem started, uh, every board meeting again, Kruijf started again up and saying, well, I want him as a managing director. The other four said, well, that is a, a ship that has passed. We will have to look to new, uh, new managing directors. So basically, he doesn't understand that he has to consult these. He just wants to always have his opinion put forward and that's it. No, there are a, a board of five, but everybody has the same vote. So Kruijf has 20% for the vote and all the other members, including Edgar Davids, also got 20% of the votes. Then about two weeks ago, they had found a new man in Marco van Basten, which of course is a very big name. Yeah. That apparently was against Kruijf's wishes. So he leaked that van Basten was a candidate to the Dutch newspaper, The Telegraaf, which is the biggest newspaper there is. And he has a column in that Kruijf for the last 20, 25 years. And he's always uh, using the newspaper to influence everything that happens to Ajax. When it, the news leaked out from, from Boston, from Boston said, well, the process is not far or formalized. And this way with, with Kai approaching the newspapers, I don't want it. So he, he, he said, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And then two days later, the, the four board members came with Van Gaal as their, their, their man. And that was really a, a sign that they were completely fed with Kruijf, trying to hold all procedures within the, the, the board and always trying to get his, um, his men and only, always pushing his own wishes through uh, against everything else in the club. It, That's what is really what happened. Jan, I understand why they didn't agree with his candidate, but I don't quite understand why they wanted Van Gaal. I mean, I'm from Germany, I understand what happened with Van Gaal in, in Munich, you know, he was a man who could not work with anyone apart from himself, like a little dictator, brilliant Absolutely. on the pitch, but off the pitch, a disaster. So how can a guy no like, different in Holland. So how can a guy like that run, run a club? I'm not sure if he can, but uh, he is, of course, he's a child also of Ajax. And Ajax is even, and that says a lot, even more a difficult club than Bayern Munich. With Bayern Munich, <laughs> they, they got uh, very, very clear lines and everybody knows who influences everybody. With Ajax, everything happens always under the table and it's a very, very difficult club to run. It's one of the reasons why Martin Yo, for example, when the whole uh, shebang started uh, a year ago, resigned and said, I don't want it, this, this, this will, uh, this Make, will, will make the club unworkable, which has been proved for the, the one year later. It is exactly on this day a year ago that that you resigned on, on uh, December the 5th. Uh, yeah, so uh, it, it is a very hard club and, and the board, the, the four members said to, to lead this club, we need somebody who is so robust that he can fight against uh, the Kruijf group and the Piet Keizer group and the Jacques Swart group and all those fractions within the club. One who is so very, very strong personality that he is able to, yeah, uh, to to hold his his line and will not be influenced. And that you can say from Van Gaal, he will not be influenced by anybody. Yeah, no. Thank you so much for your input, Jan. Yes. I, I personally think that they're both really stubborn characters, so it'll be interesting to see what uh, happens then. Um, Jan is the owner of the biggest mahogany wardrobe I've ever seen in my life. Oh, are you a bit jealous? Little, is it, or was it a time machine he had behind him? It was huge, whatever it was. Nice panelling. I was going to say speaking of mahogany, but I can't actually do anything with that. Um, but we'll talk about El Clasico now. Um, Barcelona, Berni going to travel to El Bernabeu. What do you think is going to happen? I, can tell you I mean, it I looks like Real Madrid at the moment. Uh, it's all about Real Madrid. That's, so, that's been a narrative of the season. Mourinho getting there, unsettling Barcelona. I think that's going to be a reaction from Barcelona. And I've just got a feeling they're going to show up and, then and they're show that it. they're still the number one on the planet. <laughs> Far from it. I don't think so at all. I'm, uh, I mean, I've watched Barcelona struggle through a few games recently, most notably against Seville at home, was my favourite game in La Liga this season. That was an absolute belter, where Seville just total rearguard action and really physical. Every challenge was, was, was a strong in-your-face There was in some bit of thing. equa planning going on There was well. all sorts going on. And there was Isn't that the, how they played against Real Madrid last season Penalty as well? save in the 93rd minute. That mm -hmm. was my game this season in La Liga. Bilbao also troubled them by being physical, giving them no space, and by keeping that intensity up 
through the whole 90 minutes. Um, I, th I think, as Raf says, Barca have got a massive point to prove here because everyone in Spain, uh, this, especially the markers and ass of this world, have just been all over Madrid. This is going to be our year, the Champions League's coming, Mourinho's finally got it together and just wait for the bubble to burst when Barcelona turn yeah, but, up at the... Yeah, but even the if they also... Up. I have a sneaky feeling that Ralph might be right because he tends to be right about these things. But even with all of that, can we just talk about a second? Let's talk about the PK yellow card, OK? Now, it was very much, if he got a yellow card, then he would be banned from a Clasico if, mm -hmm. he, was to play, if he had picked one up against Levante. He was probably going to pick one up against Levante. So instead, he picked one up um, before that so that he could miss the game of, against Levante and be there for the Clasico. Now, I'm really sorry, but isn't that a Mourinho move? Well, if you look at it this way, right? He got booked for time-wasting in a game they were cruising to victory. No, no, it's Rayo Vallecano, who haven't been in La Liga for how many years? Yeah, and but, what? But, yeah. but, yeah, so, he, he, I mean, there, there's... They might have come back, back into the yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, on the 83rd yeah, minute. Never say never. On the 83rd yeah, minute. minute. They've looked into it, and he's been... It, it, it's legit yellow card. I mean, look, these it's things really have been yeah. happening for 50 years, yeah? It's only because Mourinho makes everything an issue, and sometimes did those things too blatantly as he did in the Champions League that people have clogged up. John is Terry he, did the same thing the other day in the, it's fine. to be suspended in the League want. Cup. Who cares? Who cares? He took five minutes to take a free, to throw in. He was suspended for the League Cup. He was very happy. Was it an issue? No. Right, but because don't, target Mourinho, don't target Mourinho and Real Madrid when you go and do exactly the same thing and you try to cover it up by getting Valdez doing exactly the same thing a few minutes earlier than that. My but problem it's got is, is that to do with Cruyff came out and said, oh, Real Madrid have really tarnished their image you know we're the good side you know everyone's everyone's obsessed with Barcelona they have a really good image do they do they have a good image when that's what they're doing what essentially they're doing is very much the same as Madrid they just don't have someone as outspoken well I don't quite recall Mad Barcelona trying to kick Real Madrid off the park I think there was slightly one-sided yes you could say there's gamesmanship they roll around quite a lot uh, they try to influence the referee they do all these things yes with his, but uh, are they breaking people's legs are they getting sent off all the time no so, you no, know, we I are agree. talking about two very different things here. Well, no, I don't think so, because I think my, my problem with all of this is not that they don't do something. I would probably do that if I was Guardiola. I'd be like, you know what, pick a yellow card up, pick a, get, a, get yourself a yellow card. But my problem is the reaction. If it was Mourinho, it would have been dealt with differently. It would have been different if it was Madrid. But unfortunately, because it's, uh, it's Barcelona, it was looked into and nothing came out of it. Isn't that just something that always happens with Barcelona? I don't want to be a non-conformist because it just looks like I'm now just sort of anti-Barcelona ranting. But you are anti-Barcelona <laughs> ranting. Yeah. And also, the, the interesting thing in, in this equation is the referee involved in all of this, Perez Lassa, notoriously stringent by the book Spanish referee. If ever there was anyone who was going to look into this and raise, you know, some some questions over the booking, it would have been him. He didn't do it. He let it go. You know. Okay. And Mourinho's doing a wonderful job, isn't he, of not talking about Barcelona and mm. in the build-up to this. Should, right. Well, well, it's a good move not to talk for him. We should do it more often. We should do it more often. But we've got a lady on uh, Skype who's uh, who's with us. Hello, Patty. How are you? Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we Absolutely. can hear you. Buenas noches from Spain. Tell us all the news and all the reactions so far to what's been happening with the... Well, Classico. I'm in Valencia, so I'm in the middle of, of the two sit big cities. And everyone's talking about the match, obviously. It's going to be a big match. It's going to be a battlefield, I think, this weekend. Um, there has been quite violent matches in the past, so it's um, going to be quite hard to see who's going to win. I mean, Madrid is all hyped up about having six points more than Barcelona. But um, I think it would be a very big moral blow if Barcelona wins this weekend. Tell me, uh, do you think that there's a danger that Real Madrid are so in love with themselves and with their <laughs> new fantastic attacking football that they'll try it against Barcelona? And one thing we haven't seen from all the teams who have beaten Barcelona, they cannot attack them. They have to sit and defend. And that's how Mourinho won the Copa del Rey. That's how he's caused them problems. As soon as he starts attacking, aren't they, aren't they going to be hit? Aren't they going to be found out? I mean, everyone's reputation is on the line this weekend. It's not just um, Mourinho and Pep. It's um, There are players against each other and and uh, Messi against Cristiano because they are against each other in the um, Golden Ball Award. Um, there is a lot of pressure on the on both teams to win. But obviously, what you said tactically, um, I think that Mourinho is going to wait and try to win how he won the Copa del Rey. 
tell me, are the, what is the gossip at the moment? Like, you know, the, the stuff that we kind of all want to hear about, the dirt in the newspapers about the, the two teams. I mean, uh, the Barcelona press talking uh, talking about Mission Possible and not Mission Impossible at the Bernabeu Stadium. But um, Madrid uh, focus um, them as victims, saying that um, because the Barcelona press are saying that, oh, it's the best moment for Madrid, they're in a good shape, so that to lose all the pressure on themselves. And um, the the press from Madrid saying, oh, they're... they're they're like victims and they're saying that um, we have we're in our best moments so that they don't have that much pressure yeah. but um, sorry yes no I was gonna ask you also about Ozil partying is this actually true because Ozil is the Ozil, last person yeah. um, <laughs> I they, would never they, imagine they him they have caught him partying a lot the thing is that Mourinho is still defending him and he is um, has a lot of confidence in him and he has answered that in some statements he said you know I'm, I'm impressed about how Mourinho isn't taking into um, all this stuff about me partying all over the place so um, if Mourinho is happy with him then he'll be playing and now they're also talking about which ones have the most beautiful girlfriends or wives <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a the the, the press are uh, also focusing on making jokes on who play, on whose girlfriend is the prettiest out of the both teams because there's you know quite a, me a lot of mediatic girlfriends behind the players. Um, we've got the most mediatic um, couple, which is obviously Shakira and Piquet. Well, it should have been Ibra and Piquet at the time. That was the gossip. Yeah, sorry, uh -huh. go on. And um, we also have goalkeeper Valdez and his girlfriend, which were recently on a magazine about a month ago, making, um, well, and quite some raunchy photos. And Cesc and his li <laughs> Lebanese girlfriend, uh, I don't know whether you know about that. Um, he's yeah, with a, a 12, year, 12 years older than him. I actually saw them in a Japanese restaurant not that long ago. She's much older than him yeah. and she has children, from what I know. Um, but tell yeah, us about Valencia. Uh, tell us about the Valencia. What do you think are their chances uh, for in the Champions League now? Well, um, obviously we're all looking at Chelsea now and um, every, uh, the players are already there. Uh, here we are optimistic. We know that with a draw that we, go, that we get past. Obviously we know that Chelsea is on the line as well and that they are at home and they are going to go really really for that win because otherwise they're out of the competition but um, we're optimistic and we think that we have our, a good chance of, of remaining in the competition. If I was a Valencia fan now my main worry would be whether they can hang on to their manager. I think you know we've talked about a couple of managers, Luis Enrique we spoke about mm -hmm. earlier today. Now Emery and the job he's done at Valencia absolutely outstanding on limited resources not a lot of money to spend he came to that club when they were in absolute turmoil they'd started building a stadium they couldn't finish if I was if I was manager of any you know Paris Saint-Germain they might be looking for a manager I would knock right on his door he's someone who I'd have on my radar um, as one of the well um, surprisingly the, the uh, general public here in Valencia are not that pleased with Emery's results in the couple in the last couple of it's years unbelievable. I mean that's that's unbelievable. That's absolutely I, well, I, honestly I think he's a terrible manager what um, Let's I've seen, I'm Go sorry, I've well, seen Valencia, yeah. they completed the I mean, they were, they the were team. Him burro, burro, which is like um, donkey. donkey here in Spanish from the, the I mean, the Valencia um, supporters are very, very, you know, they want their stuff, they want titles and um, we're on, we're in the third position here in the league and the, all of the focus is on Barcelona and Madrid and they, uh, you know, they want results. I mean, okay. as it stands now, as a fan of Valencia, Sevilla, Malaga, whoever you are in Spain, you, you might as well forget finishing above Real and Barca. What he's done is fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Paddy, for being with us. Thank you. We we'll hope to speak to you soon. It's nice to have another girl on the show. Um, wait, I can't it's not so much the, the results or not winning the title, it's the way they play. I mean, I've seen them quite a lot and they are completely all over the shop, chaotic, disorganized. One half they play this way, the other half he changes everything around, corrects all the mistakes and they're half decent. They are quite shambolic. They have good players like Soldado who carry them through, yeah. who, are, you know, who keep getting the results. But as a manager, I don't see anything that's But you don't think that's, that's a bit that's of a harsh statement considering no. that they've lost all their greatest players and they're consistently always selling their best off like Silva, like Juan Mata, like... Yeah, but it doesn't, doesn't mean that as a manager that you cannot get your tactics right from the outset, that you always have to spend half of the game 
correcting the mistakes you've made in the first half, which seems to be happening all the time. And the Chelsea against uh, Leverkusen, I mean, they were just unbelievably bad, unbelievable. And that's why, but, as Patty told you, fans who see the team every week, unlike us, are very unhappy with him. I mean, I mean, my counter argument to that, Raf, would be a lot of managers get the chance to, to make a team in their own image. They get the chance to go out there and buy the players they want. He's picking up second-hand dregs. No, but that's actually, no, but that's, but that's actually wrong, so Owen, because, because outside England, that's what managers do. They don't pick their teams. They get a team picked for them by the sporting director, and their job is to get the yeah, best out of those t 11 or mm. 16. And he certainly doesn't, because... You, you see from the way Valencia play, they're very inconsistent. That's why, as a manager, he's not highly rated. When oh. you look at the results, though, where they are, and how they, I mean, they're still in with a shout of getting through yeah, in the Champions absolutely. League. You can't argue, well, it's a no. results business. I guess, listen, true, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, because if you're not Barcelona and you're not uh, Real Madrid, pff, are you really ever going to seriously be winning La Liga? I'll ask Rafa Benitez. <laughs> well, I'll let you um, that one. Right, this, seg this segment is over, but we're going to go straight to a break. But if you come back in a few minutes, we're going to be talking about gossip. We're going to give you the details of what happened in uh, last week's poll, who won the best right bank. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Don't miss out. Hello and welcome back to the World Football Show here on Sports Tonight Live. Now we're going to have a new section where we discuss all the gossip that we've heard. Um, ultimately, we'd like to talk about who's going out with who, but we're kind of uh, worried that that might be slanderous and we don't want to upset anyone. So I know that you, you were telling us about Podolsky going somewhere. Yeah, I, mean, I was talking to Raf about this before we came on. I think in terms of transfer gossip and speculation, yeah. for me, um, the, the, the story doing the rounds at the moment regarding Podolsky and Arsenal could have some legs. I think uh, Van Persie's still not got his contract wrapped up, but I'd be surprised to see Van Persie leave Arsenal now, especially after the season he'd had. No. Bringing in Podolsky, I think, would be a, would be a smart move. Mm. Yeah, well, yes and no. I mean, he is a player who's got the potential and you see every time he turns up for Germany at the competition, he delivers and he has a fantastic shot. He's left-footed, uh, very, very fast, can play on the left, can play behind the striker, can play as a centre-forward. Ideal player in many ways. However, in the past, he struggled whenever he was playing outside of Cologne. At Bayern, he really flopped. He was talking about moving back all the yeah, time. But, I mean, now he's moved back, he's realised... Yeah, Cologne is great, but perhaps this team is not really going places. And he's beginning to change his mind. And Joachim Löw only the other day said, I think this new Podolski is more mature. I can see him make that move. So I think if Arsenal are serious, and I'm not sure they are because they have a habit of scouting someone to death uh, and sign them when they're 45 and then realise, oh, actually, uh, we're a little bit late. Um, if they are serious, they can get him because Cologne will sell and I think he would go. Well, Klose really worked out in Lazio, and I, I feel like if you work if you work out in the German in the German national team, then you'll sort of work out anyway. But also, I want to also talk about the fact that uh, Galliani wants Tevez for free. Um, do you reckon that he'll go for it? Now, what's really interesting about Milan, other than the fact they want everything for free, they have this amazing structure in their club where when you enter, they have a portfolio of properties. So you just, you know, you go in and you, you tell them where you want to live. They'll be like, do you want to live in the centre? Do you want a big house on the... Like, where do you want to live? You tell them where. Like, Flamini got a four-bedroom flat in the, in the cent city centre. And then they offer you, you know, handmade suits. They offer you cars. I mean, it's just such a brilliant atmosphere. Do you think Tevez would not absolutely love that and be willing to go for it? Um, I think he would go also if, if you tell him he has got absolutely nowhere to live because it's still better, I think, than sitting on the bench for... a. Uh, for Manchester City, which will, which would happen to him, um, it's a very difficult scenario because, on the one hand, City would love nothing more uh, than to fire him um, after all he, all the stunts he's pulled. The problem is they cannot then protect their value as far as the transfer market is concerned. So they're caught in between these, these, these uh, extremes. They want to get rid of him, but they don't want to get rid of him because otherwise they can't cash in. And a loan deal, again, as in the past in similar cases, seems to be the only sensible move forward. The problem is, because he's on such massive wages, all the clubs who take him, like Adebayo in the past at Real Madrid, for example, say, yes, we'll take him, but you still pay uh, for a huge percentage of his salary. Or if you don't, we'll get him for absolutely free. And of course, City are not agreeing to do that. OK, well, actually, the gossip section, we only had like about a couple of minutes on it. But now this is my favourite section in which we get to choose 
our favorite teams or basically the best team in history if we were going to construct one. Now Yashin took the goalkeeper. Last week we were talking about right backs. I chose Cafu um, and I won. He got 35% of the votes. Uh, we'd actually like you to get in, in touch with us. So please tweet us on ST Football and tell us who you think. Uh, we're going to start talking now about the centre backs. We want to hear from you, what you who you think deserves to be in that uh, in the best, greatest 11. Um, and uh, if you agree with one of us, are you surprised that uh, Cafu won? No, I'm not, because your picks tend to win, and I think the voting is fixed, because they always get 35% for some reason. Always a really nice round number. No, wait, hold on. Very hold on. odd. Hold on. Wasn't Yashin Philippe's choice? I know, I know. Right. So didn't he win? He did. Oh, and where did I come? Just because you came nowhere with you, Oliver Kahn. You came second. <laughs> okay, you Oliver tell me. Oliver Kahn. Who's your choice for centre-back? You tell me, Owen. Okay, I'm going Ronald Koeman. Um, I was born in seconds. Holland, a little bit of Dutch bias. And also because I was um, eight years old. I remember the goal he scored in 1992 in the Champions League finals. Probably the first goal I remember. Unbelievable. Also, a lot of a lot of people forget the sheer quantity of goals he scored. 193 league goals in 503 games for a centre-back. That's unbelievable. And also, he played in teams, the European Cup winning side, where the strikers thrived on those long through balls. He was the one who made Van Basten's work possible. He's my tip. Yeah. Back. I would support you if he hadn't wiped his backside with, with a German shirt after the 19. Raf, go with your centre back. Sorry, yes, uh, my centre back um, is Cannavaro. Can not the Ooh. not the Palermo Cannavaro. Not the no. sorry, not the Napoli, Napoli Cannavaro, Fabio but Cannavaro. the real Cannavaro, the elder Cannavaro. I've never seen a defender dictate uh, or, or dominate a game as he did during the World Cup. I mean, it was just a, a, a marvel to watch this guy, how he won everything, how he was complete in control. I think for, if it wasn't for him, Italy would have been nowhere near the World Cup. A decent Italy side, nothing spectacular. He made it happen. Best centre-back ever. Well, I mean, he is Italian, so that, that's not very unusual. I also went for an Italian. I don't think that's very unusual because they are the best defenders. After all, we play very defensive football, apparently. I went for Claudio Gentile, um, mainly because of his man-marking skills. He is the ultimate stopper. He made one of the, he created alongside Gaetano Shorea one of the best defensive partnerships uh, and he had at a Juve great and Italy. Um, he was the guy who um, man-marked Maradona out of the 1982 World Cup. At the time, Maradona said that he didn't know how to turn, to kick or anything because he was so scared that his ankles were going to be s snapped off. Um, moreover, he was the man that said uh, football is not for ballerinas and I never knew that until he told us. But uh, that's all we have choice. time for. Get involved. Mm -hmm. Tweet us at ST World Football. But now, uh, join us next week at the same time. We'll leave you with uh, some goals to look at. Thank you from all the panel. Pleasure.